Welcome newcomers and welcome back to Creator Talks. I'm your host, Christopher Calloway. I'm really excited to present to you today this interview with Dean Haspiel. Dean was one of the first persons that I interviewed and one of the first articles I wrote for a local newspaper. I saw Dean at Baltimore Comic Con, had a chance to talk to him, and now I can bring to you my interview with him while he was working in studio late one night on his upcoming webcomic, War Cry, which is the follow-up to Red Hook, which is found on Line Webtoons, and his upcoming play that he wrote, Harry Carey Kane, Die, Die Again, and that'll be debuting at the Brick Theater in Brooklyn in just a few days. I also had a chance to chat with Dean about his experience at the New York Comic Con and how physically that was very difficult for him. And I discussed with Dean some of his thoughts around the future of Comic Cons and how they can be improved. Also, I talked with Dean about the state of the comic book industry. How can it sustain itself with 399 comic books? Perhaps digital comics are the future and there'll still be a place for print, but he has some thoughts around that. And it's always good to get Dean's insight as someone who works in the industry. We also talk about some of Dean's freelance work that he's doing and a little teaser about a project that he's working on yet to be announced. And of course, we talk about one of his biggest influences, Jack King Kirby. My guest, a man who once worked with Harvey Picard, Walt Simonson and Howard Chaikin, did work for Marvel Comics, DC, and Archie Comics. I present to you numerous Eisner Award nominee, Emmy Award winner, and Ringo Award winner, Dean Haspel, here now on Creator Talks. Welcome to Creator Talks. Here you are. (laughs) Hey, hey. So uh, you're working, is this freelance work? This is not uh, Red Hook. It is Red Hook. It's War Cry, which is, you know, basically Red Hook season two, uh, which I'm calling War Cry. And uh, because it features this this new iteration of of a previous character. And I'm on page, what would equal to be page 73 of a graphic novel version of the story. But of course, online webtoon, it's not pages, it's it's a vertical scroll that you just scroll through with your thumb and you just see different panels. So, yeah. And so right now, I mean, I wrote the whole thing. Was it either earlier this year or late last year? I think it was, I can't remember. And now I'm just drawing it and it's, it's approximately 130 pages, uh, you know, in comic book terms, but you know, it's a whole ton of panels for the vertical scroll. And when do you uh, launch that? So launching it, um, I wasn't sure about the date, but I believe the date is November 15th. And I was asking uh, Tom to push it back, Tom Akel, my editor, a little bit because I want to have, you know, these are 26 chapters and I want to have 16 chapters in the can. I'm working on chapter 14 right now. Uh, I'm hoping to get, you know, two more done before we launch, because when we launch, we always launch uh, with three chapters, or at least that's that's traditionally how they launch uh, their comics, uh, that you start with three chapters. So you lose like two weeks of, you know, stuff that were in the bank, as it were, you know, uh, for for production and whatnot. So I like to have at least uh, maybe not two thirds of it done, but uh, almost two thirds so that, you know, as because those weeks go by quick. I, I discovered with the Red Hook, and, you know, they they, oh, they, yeah. they start to they start to reduce, and then you're like almost playing catch up. Now I never, with the first season, I didn't you know I didn't lose any steam or anything, um, but also I was producing three chapters a month uh, when I was doing Red Hook, but in this case I'm doing two because of how much other stuff I've been juggling, which we can also talk about. You know, the the play that I wrote that's also debuting soon, and then. Uh, other freelance work that we can talk a little bit about. But yeah, I'm really excited to be, you know, coming out with a second season of The Red Hook via Warcry and being able to tell more of this story. Uh, and and I've actually even <laughs> I've actually even plotted out the next major story and the one after that. So I have a lot of ideas for this character. Well, that's awesome. Well, first of all, again, congratulations on winning the Ringo Award at Baltimore, the first oh, one. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's, that's um, what was great about that award is that it's my first industry award, meaning a uh, comic book industry award, you know, the actual industry I work in. Uh, yeah, I, I joked when I won my award that I'm used to getting Emmys, which, of course, was just me, <laughs> you know, taking the piss out of it. But, 
but no, I was really honored and proud to be able to uh, not only win an industry award, but in particular this brand new award because I won this award at my favorite sh uh, comic show uh, of the year, which is Baltimore Comic Con. And, you know, the organizers, Mark Nathan, Brad Tree, all, all the folks at Baltimore Comic Con, you know, treat me like family. And they, they have ever since 9-11 uh, happened. And we, uh, I'm trying to remember how I met Mark. It was because 9-11 happened in New York City and we were supposed to have, uh, oh wait, was it, was it around SPX maybe? I think SPX, the small press expo that takes place in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, basically they, I think they had to shut down the show or move it to another time or something or something happened and mark nathan who didn't know like barely any of these different indie guys or indie cartoonists girls and boys offered like tables and space at at his convention in 2001 and how do you say no to that you know um and that's that was my basic introduction to not only mark nathan and baltimore comic-con but to this beautiful wonderful staff of people who love comic books you know, and, and you've done the show, so you've been there, you, right? I mean, I love that show. It's great. Yeah. And, you, and like somebody was asking me yesterday, like, why is it a great show? And it's not that it's the biggest show or has the most celebrities, all that. that that's part of the reason why it is a great show, because it doesn't do all that stuff. Because what it does is it honors comic books and it honors the people who make the comic books and it honors the readers and the fans and, and the retailers who sell the comics and I think that's a lot of why I love that show is that it keeps it real in that way. You just got back from New York Comic Con right. a couple of weeks ago, and it was brutal on you physically. Yes. It, it, okay. So, I mean, I, you know, I like to be a tough guy. I, I, I'm a little macho, right? You've been knocked but about I, a bit. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. I, I try to, you know, uh, at least pretend to be that. But, you know, I, I did turn 50 recently. I have busted legs from falling off a three-story building when I was 21 years old and Broke my knee and my ankle and my lower back and my right hand. And I was in a wheelchair and crutches and all this stuff. So and because I haven't really had proper good uh, health insurance and I haven't really taken care of myself as 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 well as I should have in my life, um, it's starting to, you know, it's starting to bite me in the ass a little bit, which means walking like the Jacob Javits Center for four days is murder. If it was empty. And I had to walk back and forth. It, I would already probably be, you know, in, in an emergency room. But the fact that it was so packed that, you know, and more than ever before, I think it was a record year this year. Um, and that the bathrooms were, I had never seen long lines of men waiting for the bathroom. That is unusual. Like, that was new to me. And also uh, just the shuffling of the feet and feeling claustrophobic and suddenly getting caught in, in these like human gluts in areas and, and, and taking forever to get from point A to point B, I think I spent probably 80% of the show trying to get to somewhere versus enjoying what was there. And I'm not blaming necessarily the organizers of New York Comic Con. I'm talking about the, the, the space, the Jacob Javits Center. I, I've talked to other people who, who understand architecture, and they're like, yeah, it's a terribly designed you know, arena uh, for things like this. And so it's not just that I'm being a whiny little brat. It's, it's that it actually is a terrible space. And then unfortunately, uh, this year, they, uh, Artist Alley had to be moved to a basement because the Artist Alley that, that they've been running the last bunch of years, that actual area, which was like another huge room, it was almost like its own convention. That area is being demolished and either, I don't know, redesigned or, or I don't even know what. I don't know, it's going to be a parking lot. I don't know what it's going to be. But so it meant that they had to uh, not only reduce the space, put it down into a windowless basement, but then, you know, a lot of people like to go see the artists. So that place was packed beyond the gills, you know, and it was just a really unpleasant, uncomfortable experience. And again, I'm not blaming the organizer of the show. I'm actually talking about the space and I just wish they wouldn't do that show there. But then when people ask, well, where else would you put that show? It's like, I don't know. And so one of the things I was thinking is, well, why don't you do satellites? You know, you take you take that a, a space, but then you have all these satellite areas. And guess what? That is what they did this year. So, <laughs> you know, they had the big space. They had the satellites. It still was huge and ginormous and difficult. So I actually have no answer. I mean, what, one thing I was thinking was, what about Brooklyn? You know, the Barclays Center, you know, this big stadium. But it's a big stadium. 
You know, you're not going to do a Comic Con at a stadium. Well, actually, that's not true. I think uh, who's doing that right now? The Sheamus Brothers, I think, are doing something called Ace. I believe they're doing it at some stadium. Oh wow! Show in December, and uh, you know, we'll see how that goes. But yeah, I don't know the answer, man. I I I just know it was very difficult, and and I, you know, I did when I complained about it. I was really talking more about the space versus. I mean, you know, they still have good panels. Uh, tons of fans, great artists and celebrities and signings and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, to, to actually go there is so daunting that I, I don't know if I could go back, to be honest. Well, I've never been able to go because it conflicts with something I have to do for work that same weekend every year. Oh my God. I, I want to go, but I'm also a little intimidated by just the size of it and the crowds. You're saving yourself not going, honestly. <laughs> I mean, like, First of all, if you want to get news and all that, you know, that comes up online. You know, you're going to find out everything happening anyway. But to actually experience it, if you're like, oh, I want to go experience it, you're saving yourself. Do not, you're not missing anything. You're missing, you know, a lot of pain and a, a lot of frustration is what you're missing, you know, to be honest. I've had a lot of fun at Baltimore Comic Con, at Heroes Con, and even the fairly new New Jersey Expo. Fine, you know, not massively crowded in any way. And that's why they're good. And that's why they're good because they're not huge. And, you know, again, it's it's New York City. I haven't gone to San Diego Comic-Con in, in about 11 years because of that reason 11 years ago. You know, and of course, I'm sure that's only grown exponentially as well. And I maybe I'm just too old and beaten up to, <laughs> to do these kinds of cons anymore. You know, you said in your blog, uh, you're suggesting maybe an Angoulême. Oh, my. oh, okay. So you know what that is, right? <laughs> it's like a commune? So No, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> the things we learn about the, the, uh, about other people. No. Um, so, so Angoulême is in France. I've never been. But it's a small town that they literally convert into a comics town. So it means that like not only are there – is there the main venues that – you know, host the, the comic shows, but that every restaurant or, or a lot of restaurants and a lot of like other little places uh, in the town also participate in some way. And yeah, it's not New York, it's not California, but it is France, although it's not Paris. Um, and you have to travel there and you get a hotel and whatnot. And they, I think you go for like a week or something or a long weekend. And it's this beautiful uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've seen reports, I've seen pictures, I've heard legend of it. And that's where I was thinking, well, maybe what you do is you have just a bunch of satellites or maybe, hell, maybe New York City. If, if Comic Con's becoming so popular, you know, why don't you just take over Times Square and call it Times Square Con or something, you know, and, and have all the billboards be all the ads for the, for the cartoonists. Or you see maybe, you know, you know, whatever they call Hall H or something. Is that in, in San Diego where, where you hear about, you know, the big kind of celebrity, um, you know, panels mm -hmm. or whatever. Like instead, why don't you project that like Blade Runner on, on you know, in Times Square, you know. And But I guess what? That is going to happen in the future. I guarantee, you know, this be, continues to be as popular a, as where it's going. Um, but, yeah, so that was my, you know, one suggestion I had was like, well, why not just, you know, uh, disperse it, you know, have it uh, be all over everywhere. But then again, you kind of lose that thing, the thing being that you're in one area that you can just, you know, supposedly walk to with ease to, to go see the many different things that, that the con offers uh, to then go outside, you know, and deal with traffic and people or, or at least other more people, strangers uh, who, who don't care about comics um, that that could prove daunting as well. So, you know, I, I don't think this stuff out too well because I'm just reacting emotionally but that was one thing I thought about. And I've always wanted to go to Angoulême because I've heard such great things. Well, it's not a bad idea. I mean, you think about like a festival, really. Um, yeah. I, we have a festival in my area. It's called uh, the Arden Festival, Arden Fair. And it's this whole town, Arden. It's not huge, uh, but right. it's just the art festival spread out over more space. And um, yeah, it's... But and it's, is the whole town, the whole town like participates in a way or yeah it's well it's a really it's a small town it's it's a place where you uh you have to lease your land like you would in hawaii and then buy your house 
Right. Uh, so it's like an artist community. That's how it built oh, wow. up initially. Yeah. So it's a good spot for a festival, and it's like the whole neighborhood. It's like a very just kind of spread out. It's not like not like a city or a town so much. But I see what you're saying about the city of France could be a good place. So any small city, I think, could could achieve this goal. The problem is, it would have to still probably be something of a small show. Mm-hmm. You know, before it became like, you know, as much of a glut. So I think what happens is that because it's New York City, because it's so, you know, we're dealing with popularity and, and all that stuff. And I mean, you know, I think that's part of the problem is, you know, it, it's become so popular that a lot of people want to go. Unfortunately, that was the other the complaint I had was a lot of my friends and family were like, oh, I heard Comic Cons this weekend because I'll start seeing the ads the week of. And I keep thinking, why are there ads for Comic Con if you can't sell tickets? <laughs> right. <laughs> Why are you telling anybody about it? Are you just dangling some weird carrots? Some 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 like you know, are you cock teasing comics or something? Like I don't get it. You know it because they they wind up saying, oh, I try to get a ticket, I can't get a ticket. I was like, I know. You they don't sell them. They're they're done. You know they were sold like concerts. It's like some big rock concert. You have to get these tickets like five or six months. Um, you know, when they first mentioned that, that they're available and then they're gone, you know, so I feel bad for people who want to do the impulse buy or, or suddenly decide they have a free weekend and they want to bring their family or something, which to me is the spirit of, of the, you know, of what this is supposed to be about, you know? Yeah, it's a shame that they've gotten so big and they're bringing in movies and television. And I understand why they want to bring in more people that maybe huh. have never looked at comics, but I, I think they're pretty much staying away from the comics and just going for those exclusive panels it, and the, the giveaways. It feels like that more and more is happening. It feels like there's more like, you know, the, the cartoonists are becoming like weird zoo animals in the <laughs> yeah, paper. Right. You know? And so, you know, and yet we're the ones creating the source material, right? But I think what's starting to happen is that movies and television are taking over, at least the mainstream franchise comics, you know? Like, that's not necessarily the case for a lot of the indie stuff. But then indie stuff has a smaller fan base that wouldn't necessarily get an ad or draw a whole bunch of people until they discovered it on their own, you know. Um, so it, it, it's 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 a it's a conundrum because you kind of need the actors and and or the, the the new adaptations or iterations, the ones that are moving pictures, you know, the versions to kind of draw that kind of fan base who are often also like the ones who are dressing up, you know, the cosplayers. You know, um, they're dressing up more like um, the movie versions than they are the comic book versions, you know, and and that's the costumes that they're selling as well, unless they're making their own, you know. So I don't know. I mean, I I sound like a grumpy cartoonist because I am in some ways, but, you know, it's it's my right. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah, something else you mentioned on your blog that I had not heard this rumor about Disney selling their IPs of you know Marvel's IPs and having someone else produce the books. So I read that as well somewhere. I might have shared that or something. Yeah. Or I don't yeah. Remember, but like first of all, that actually makes sense, you know, in a way, because listen, Marvel isn't producing a, a Fantastic Four comic right now for whatever stupid reason because of some infighting with Fox because they you know that's that's one of the properties that they sold earlier on. And Fox is holding on to it for whatever reason, because they're not really doing any good versions of, of the Fantastic Four, you know. So why not just give it back to Marvel and let Marvel do their fourth wave or whatever the hell, you know, is next. But, uh, the you know, one of the things I've thought about, and this is me, you know, we all have the answers, right? When we're sitting in our little uh, art studios or rooms, we all have our answers. Um, but... One of the things I thought about is there's so many comics being made and produced. And obviously DC and Marvel are kind of fighting each other by producing as many comics as possible uh, to kind of like crunch each other out or something. I just wish, you know, we don't need five X-Men comics or 10 Spider-Men or, you know, however many Avenger comics or, you know, Batman and all that. I just figure, you know, if they were smart, they, you know, they're just an IP farm now, right? Or they have old intellectual property like a Batman or Spider-Man. And instead of doing all these comics, why don't you just produce one Spider-Man a comic if you, you know, a month if you feel like it's necessary, then collect those, and then have more, you know, lore mythology, and then and then focus on the TV and movies because that is uh, getting a bigger audience, you know, and just you know keep your hands. Uh, you know, creating th- that kind of material for those mediums, you know, because 
How many people actually read comics? How many people that went to Comic-Con read comics, right? So why doesn't Marvel just produce 20 comics a month, you know, one Spider-Man, one Thor, one Avengers, all that, and then, you know, and they don't even have to necessarily produce it in-house, just license it out, you know, if they don't want to deal with the headache of, of producing a comic. And then on top of that, why are you even putting those uh, those pamphlets, those, you know, one-sixth of a story or whatever it is or some – one year long story at, into 22 page, you know, increments. Why don't you just put that online, you know, download it, sell it for a little bit cheaper since you're not paying for distribution and, and print. And then, you know, take each story arc and then collect that and put that in print, you know? Um, and then, and then if you want to do like special one shots or special comics with uh, certain authors, like a Paul Pope, a Frank Miller, a Dean Haspiel, a Becky Cloonan, whoever, right? And their non-continuity just to have some fun and to get people who have a certain popularity or fan base to play with the toys. So you have a couple of things going. You're producing your regular, you know, the IP for the regular comic, but you're not doing 10 of them. You're doing one of them. OK, but you have enough characters that you could probably produce like 20 some odd comics. OK, and then you're doing that online. People will read the comics on the tablet and on their phone. They will, you know, begrudgingly at first. And, and there are already people doing it anyway right now. So the, the, the base is there. Then collect these things in the print. If you feel like you want to have a gift or put something on your shelf, fine. Uh, and then concurrently have like these special, you know, uh, comics that are auteur oriented, you know, productions, you know, if you feel like that's even necessary. Meanwhile, worry about, you know, transition those comics into television and movies because that's where most people are getting their stories. I mean, I, Game of Thrones, right? Walking Dead, all that stuff. That is has become our modern literature. Oh, yeah. No, I talked to uh, two people for an article about the Captain America movie that came out. It was Civil War. And right. uh, one of them was a longtime Cap fan, and one was younger and said, I first learned about all of this through the movies. D right. And just sort of n never knew about it beforehand. So, uh, right. yeah, it's definitely influencing a lot of the younger people that follow the comics. Or yes. the heroes, anyway. You know, one thing yeah. I have a concern about, um, and I can see some pushback from this. I think it's a great idea, what you're suggesting. Sure. I can see the comic shops flipping out, like, oh, my God, we're going to lose all these that's customers. The, that's the thing. So so the comic shop is, is worried, right? So what if, what about this? You know, you can't you can't be producing 4 and $5 comics, you know, with 20 to 22 pages of story just to save a comic shop. I mean, I love JHU Comics, Forbidden Planet. I love Big Planet. I love a ton of comic shops, and and I've been going since you know I discovered them you know from the newsstands. Um, but you know maybe it's an older model that's dying. You know, unfortunately, uh, you know look at our bookstores. Look what's happening, you know, uh, everywhere. And so maybe what the comic shop might need to do is if they, if 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 you know if they we're not talking about the indie stuff right now, which is in different formats, whether they're one shots, a regular series kickstarted, whatever, distributed, that's a different conversation. So let's just, I'm just going to focus on the mainstream stuff, the franchise stuff. But the franchise publishers decided, okay, sure, we were trying to make money twice by doing the pamphlet and then collecting them. But then, you know, a lot of people just buy the first issue and they wait for the trade, for the arc, blah, blah, blah. And that becomes a trend. And they decide, well, let's just pr uh, print publish the arc. We'll still continue to put it out on a regular basis online, but then we'll print publish the arc, or at least the popular stories. That can still keep a comic shop in business, but then the comic shop has to do something else. It can't just be a comic shop necessarily. Maybe it's also a laundromat and they sell beer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even kidding, man. Well, I mean, some of them do gaming, and it's been very successful for them. Well, gaming, fact, yeah, or you know, our community outreach, you know, something yes. that brings a community together. You know? Yes, yes. One near me, uh, you've been there, the comic book shop. Yep. They do. Uh, they have the reading clubs. Uh, they have right. gaming nights, and another one in my area, they have gaming nights, and they say they make most of their money from gaming. The comics are there; people can get them, but wow. it's mostly gaming. Yeah. Wow. Uh, well, that's what I mean. Then, like you know, then sell. I mean, listen. Already, you know, I didn't. I never thought about this until. I was visiting my mom in Florida a few years ago, and I went to the, their local comic shop, and I realized not only did they have no independent comics at all, but the Marvel and DCs they did have were, were far and few, meaning they had a lot of the crossover event comics, and they had some of the more popular titles, like a Spider-Man, Batman. But like I was looking for a Moon Knight or a Jonah Hex or something, and they didn't have that. 
They would only get you that if you were a local subscriber and you subscribed it and they would get it in their order. They didn't just buy extra copies and put on the racks because, well, probably because they weren't selling well for their for their area. But I grew up thinking I had access to every comic book ever published every month, every week, because I live in New York City, you know, and it didn't occur to me that, oh, wait a second, these these get curated. You know, these stores are curated and they have to figure out what comics sell at their store, you know. And some some retailers are better than others because they actually, you know, learn the material and they actually sell it to you, you know, and they get you excited. And some just rely on whatever the customer wants, you know, um, despite, you know, selling tactics. So, you know, I realized that, you know, a lot of these stores are just kind of like living on their subscription bases or their regular local cu customers and don't really think about the occasional customer that might be coming to visit their mom, you know. So. It's definitely it, – it's it's something that, like, I had to think about hard and long, and I started realizing, well, you know, comic shops have to then adapt and change. And like you said, with gaming or whatever, but I also think that comics are shouldn't be 4 or $5 for a comic book. I'm sorry. No, it's killer. And uh, one of the publishers – actually, the publisher of Alterna Comics, Peter Semedi, I've spoken to, his books are fifty on newsprint. You know, I read that. Now, I heard, heard somewhere that um, – because I wanted to do a newsprint comic once, and somebody said, no, to print uh, in newsprint is actually really expensive. So I'm actually shocked that they're so affordable, those alternative comics. Yeah, it you can know? be expensive, but they found another printer that it wasn't so expensive to do it, and that's what they're on the newsstands for. I just picked up like four of them today. Wow. Add it to my pile, and my pile's price didn't go up, and I was like, yay. So it's uh, – yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I need to learn more about them because I love that idea, you know, of going back to newsprint and who are they publishing? Are they just publishing a ton of different um, indie artists or what are they doing? They're basically indie books. Yeah. But but it's not one universe or something. It's like different art, different artists and stuff, right? They all stand alone. Yes. Oh, wow. OK. That's cool. That's very cool. So something like that, comics could survive. But like you said, probably, uh, you know, digital will be the future. Webtoons could be the future. Something like that. Right. They had a party at the New York Comic Con. That was a bright spot for you. Oh my God. That that was like one of the best comic book parties, or maybe the best comic book party I've ever been to. Um, that was really good. It was very, um, uh, at, it, it was affirming. You know, there's a lot of affirmation going on at that. Um, the people who are at Line Webtoon are really cool. They love comics. They love, you know, they're expanding. They're, they, like, they debuted a commercial a commercial about web comics that's going to be on television. Like I haven't seen that before, you know, um, they put their money where their mouth is. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying, I'm kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. It's, it's, it, it's kind of, it's fantastic. You know, what's been going on. I'm currently in this weird autonomous space in my life where I am writing and drawing a, a comic book that, uh, that I created and I own and I'm being paid to basically just be able to deliver something that they have exclusivity for online for a couple of years. And then I can currently make ancillary product like T-shirts or posters or whatever. And then about two years after ex exclusivity, I can then put those comics into print. It's insane. That's a sweet deal. How, how is that even – and I'm getting enough just to squeeze by and live in Brooklyn, one of the most expensive cities in the world, you know? So it's, it's a good deal. And, and I can't say no. Now, the only thing is when I go to comic cons and stuff for the last year or so, I don't really have anything. I don't have anything that's really new in print, except maybe a cover I might have drawn or something. So that's a little bit of a bummer because when you go to the shows, you know, I can alert them to my free web comic, but I have nothing really to sign or sell, you know? Uh, so trying to, you know, make, uh, you know, extra income, on the on this material means I have to wait a little bit, but soon that will start to to happen because of the, of the way the timing all works, and hopefully I'll be able to announce something soon about a print version of, of my Red Hook material. Oh, great! Yeah, yeah. I, I was talking to some somebody at um uh at at New York Comic Con that uh you know I have to like you know break the deal proper, but it's looking really good. So awesome. Yeah. Well, this second part of the series, War Cry. Can we talk a little bit about that? I don't want to spoil things, but just the things that I've seen, you know, as part of the promotion, not beyond that. But. <laughs> it's funny because like, 
we haven't done any proper promotion at all. So I'm just doing like my, my, you know, I got it. I finally bit the bullet and got an Instagram account and realized, wait, this is an image based platform. I'm an idiot for not having used it <laughs> so long. Anyway. Um, so like, you know, I, I'm putting up sketches or sneak peeks of like, you know, stuff I work on, including war cry and war cry, you know, as we said earlier, is basically the red hook, you know, part two. Um, because Red Hook is anchor is the anchor for me. You know, even though it, it takes place in New Brooklyn, the anchor, the character I, I'm anchored by is the Red Hook. And especially because with this second story, the stuff that I'm trying to 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 play with in the narrative is so complex that uh, and complicated that I had to, I realized that I had to tell the story kind of through the point of view of the Red Hook, who is a straight white male like me, because of what I was toying with here and one of the things that inspired or a few things that inspired war cry was my love for jack kirby's omac one man army corps and what i was playing with and i and i we had pitched this idea me and and another cartoonist buddy of mine nick bertozzi had pitched the idea of doing owac to dc one woman army corps you know basically giving omac a girlfriend you know Mm -hmm. um and and that didn't go anywhere and that was so many years ago. But I always thought about, like, God, I want to do my own OMAD. I want to have my own OMAD. And so I started thinking more of how to make that work and, and try to introduce that to, to the new Brooklyn universe with the, via the Red Hook. And then I started thinking about my love for uh, Shazam, for, you know, Captain, the original Captain Marvel. And, and, and I started mashing up this idea of OMAC and Shazam. OMAC and Shazam. How do I make this work? So I started playing with that, and then I kind of came up with this really crazy idea uh, where uh, – spoiler. there is a spoiler uh, in my explanation here, which is that at the end of the Red Hook, uh, the Red Hook's girlfriend, the possum, dies. But it does end with her on, you know, uh, the, the – what do you call it? The, not the surgery table, but the to be embalmed, the place where they embalm you, and – She's laying there and they're preparing her body and suddenly her eyes open up. And that's the way the the first season ends with this kind of weird cliffhanger. So is she alive? What happened? And what the way the war cry opens up is that we're introduced to this uh, teenage black boy named Ray Jack who has befriended all the superheroes in America. And he's kind of like their Billy Batson. You know, he's like a photographer. He's an orphan. You know, that's me playing with the Shazam side of the story. And uh, upon meeting them, there's this alien invasion and all the superheroes ally and they try to fight off the aliens, but they're killed. They're massacred. All the superheroes in America are massacred. And but they've created this caveat where they put their DNA. uh, They've mixed up all their super super DNA into this one like area of a satellite. That uh, and because they befriended this kid, they sh- uh, the kid gets shot and in, in, ingrained with all the superpowers in America. And when he shouts the word war cry, kind of like when Billy Batson shouts the word Shazam and becomes Captain Marvel, when uh, Ray Jack shoots shouts war cry, he becomes a human of mass destruction. But it, it's the resurrection of the Red Hook's dead girlfriend. And she has become this other amazing type type of like Valkyrie, this this goddess, you know, and then she defeats the the alien invasion. And suddenly there's this new superhero uh, in town uh, who's now residing in New Brooklyn. And the way that whole sequence basically ends is the Red Hook shows up uh, at the diner where this kid who's also confused by everything that's happened is sitting there eating a ton of hamburgers and milkshakes because he needs to eat. <laughs> you know, like all this energy has got depleted. And and the Red Hook says, hey, kid, um, oh, who are you? What do you want? And how can I get my dead girlfriend back? And that's how basically this story begins. Wow. And <laughs> so and then throughout the story, um, the kids, uh, they meet other kind of, there's this like these gangsters that are trying to ally with each other to kind of take over uh, how to run New Brooklyn. And of course, the Red Hook, who used to be a bad guy, is now a good guy, kind of has his ear to the ground and finds out about this stuff. And he has to stop this from happening. But he does that with the alliance of this kid who he keeps trying to turn into his girlfriend, who only really shows up when, you know, as a purpose. 
only because, you know, like when there's danger, she appears. So the other element I threw into this is like a mix up of like Firestorm, the original Firestorm, where there are two people embodying a hero. But also with the, you know, with the, the, the conflicts of like Hawk and Dove, you know, so the kid is kind of like the Dove and she uh, his uh, the Red Hook's ex-girlfriend, her, whose name is Ava Bloom, uh, she is like the hawk. And little by small, the Red Hook is reminding her who she used to be because she has this kind of amnesia. And as she starts to rediscover who she was and, and what happened here, he is trying to woo her so he can, you know, bring back the romance. But he's dealing also with this other part of her that's this kid who, on the heels of all this, discovers he's gay. So wow, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of complicated <laughs> stuff. Yeah, yeah, and and that's before we even get to the villain. So yeah, there's a lot of writing going on. There's a lot of characterization. It's really fun, and I realized that I couldn't write it from the point of view of the kid. I couldn't write it from the point of view of her. I had to write it from the Red Hook's point of view, who was the anchor of the story, even though it features Warcry. When I saw that about uh, Rajak becoming War Goddess and being the resurrection of Ava Bloom, I was like, oh boy, <laughs> this is going to really get interesting. <laughs> I mean, again, it, it's just me doing mashups of, of, you know, I mean, one of the great things about growing up with comics is the kind of comics, it inspires the kind of comics you do later on. Even though you're trying to come up with original stories or hell, sometimes we write and draw our own little memoirs. But when I, when I think about the kind of superheroes I want to write and draw, you know, I no longer have to be sanctioned by Marvel and DC. I no longer have to beg them or or try to, like, you know, impress them with my work to try to write and draw their characters. I can write and draw my own and be inspired by those, those you know, great, you know, insane characters and be able to, to tell a story like this. It's amazing uh, because you're influenced very much by Jack Kirby. Mm-hmm. And, and I was familiar with Jack's work when he was back in the 60s working with Stan and with his Marvel work, not so much his DC work. And I've gone back right. recently. In fact, when I was in Baltimore, I was running around picking up all these copies of Commandy. So I've been filling oh, yeah. in on my DC and really enjoying it because I never knew how good of a writer he was on his own until I read some of his DC work. I still think that probably Jack's best comics is his collaboration with Stanley on the Fantastic Four. Yeah. You know, I think that's just like an incredible run. Um, and, and, you know, it's a testament of, of both of them, you know? Yes. But. Like, besides loving, like, OMAC, and, and, I mean, like, you know, there's also his fourth world comics um, that he did. I, I really enjoyed, like, you know, his demon stories or, you know, uh, some of the little one-shots or, or where he didn't do – like, Devil Dinosaur is, is so much fun. And, and like, I didn't – you don't necessarily read Jack because he he has the, the, the a certain kind of uh, flair for dialogue or something – because it was so meat and potatoes, some of what he said, although, although sometimes it was hyperbolic as well. But it really, a lot of his writing is the art. The art is saying so much, even though there are words around it. You know, the, 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 the images are the text, you know, and that's the power of a Jack Kirby to be able to convey so much with, with you know, with image, you know, and and give it context like that. It was just beautiful stuff, you know. Oh, it is. And I'm enjoying catching up on a lot of it. And in fact, I've used some of it for bedtime reading for my son. Oh, wow. Actually, I have two now. <laughs> the last oh, time wow. We, yeah, I, the first time we met you at the comic shop, I had one. Now I have a second one. <laughs> well, I didn't even realize that. Well, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, so wait, so how old is the one you're reading to? Six. Okay, so... And, and is he getting it? Is he digging it? Like- yes, yes. He wants more of the dinosaur books. He wants more Devil Dinosaur. Uh, I, I've been reading Commandy to him. I've been reading uh, Mr. Miracle to him, uh, The Demon, everything right. I picked up at Comic-Con. So he wants more. Uh, he likes SpongeBob too. So I've been reading that to him. It's funny because have you read the new Have you read the new um, Tom King, Mr. Gerard, uh, Miracle Man? Yes, that's on my list and I am reading it. Yes. I haven't caught – I read the first issue and I have to go to, back to the comic shop because they, they pull comics from me. Thankfully, because I can't get to the comic shop every Wednesday anymore, but I'm and I'm like two months behind, so that I have a stack of comics. But um, I really enjoyed that first issue, but it was freaky. It was like it was like about TSD or something, you know? Like, <laughs> right. And I loved that. And so, but yeah, you have the older stuff. So that's another thing I was thinking about when I was looking at the older Marvel comics, like especially the first decade of Marvel, like sixty-one to seventy. I was like. These are all ages comics. Yes. This is, this is Pixar, you know? This is – so, I mean, adults and children could could read this stuff and get a kick out of it, you know? And and I was like, 
wow, how brilliant is that? You know, that was just so cool. And that's why I go to it for my reading material for my son. That's why I read those books yes. because I don't have to worry. You know, I mean, it's, it's all ages, so it's it's safe. And I usually – I know the stories in most cases. I've read them before. In some cases, I haven't. I'm like, I don't know. I'm finding out like you are. <laughs> right. No, it's great. And, and, and I love that – like sometimes you could tell that Jack Kirby was just like – like the demon, I think. I think originally he was supposed to just do like the first issue, launch it, and then maybe have some other people take over. But he wound up doing it. But it read, I think it was like 16 issues, the demon. And it kind of read like a movie of the week. Like whatever horror movie. You know, like the 430 movie would do horror one week and another genre. And it always felt to me like like Jack had basically like just stocked up on like some of the famous horror movies. Like there was this Frankenstein. There was this werewolf. Like. And I and and I love that kind of stuff. And but I just love that that's how he was riffing. Definitely one of the greats. Now I wanted to get a chance to talk about your play coming up. This oh. is your, this is your second play. Yeah, it's it's. <laughs> wow, I'm writing plays. It's so <laughs> weird. Um, so um, I, let me let me let me kind of get backtrack on this one. So let's just talk about the second one, and, I'll talk, and then it'll lead to the first one. Okay. And I'll go back to the second. So I was hanging out with my friend who's an actor and a director named Phil Cruz. I went to college with him. Uh, he actually plays Pat Benatar's brother in Love is a Battlefield, the MTV video. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> like way back when he was like 14. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, so we were hanging out, uh, and I think I was seeing his play or something. And, and I told him, you know, he said how much he liked reading my comics. And I was like, oh, cool. Thank you. I guess he had been reading The Red Hook or something. And I said, you know, uh, I had done a play uh, in 2014 called Switch to Kill, which was kind of a lark. And and I really enjoyed that whole process. And the way that worked out was I was hanging out at uh, Riley Brown's wedding. He's an artist uh, in Marvel. And he's actually coming out with a line webtoon comic called Outrage with uh, the Deadpool co-creator Fabian. Is it Nesicia? I can Ooh. never figure out how to say his last name. Yeah, I mean, I'll probably butcher it. <laughs> so, he, yeah, he's the co-creator of Deadpool. Anyway, Fabian and, and uh, Riley are doing a comic called Outrage for Line Webtoon, but uh, Riley did a bunch of, of Marvel comics. So he was at a wedding, and, and so naturally there'd be other cartoonists there. And uh, one of our local guys, Fred Van Lente, who writes a lot of comics, uh, was sitting at the table with me and, and, and his wife, Crystal Skillman. Now, Crystal... Uh, is a playwright and she, you know, writes a bunch of stuff and we were talking and I was saying how much I love play and theater and, and how I'd love to write a play. She's like, well, there's this festival happening at the brick theater where they, it's a comics festival where they basically take stories and or, you know, plays or whatever and turn them into theater uh, at this comics kind of festival thing at the, at the theater. And she suggested I submit something. So I looked uh, at an older screenplay because I used to write a bunch of screenplays because I want I went to film school at SUNY Purchase and because I love story even though I wanted to be a cartoonist one of the other things I wanted to do was direct films and write them so I looked at uh, I dusted off uh, an old screenplay of mine uh, from the 90s and I realized that there were two parallel stories that kind of skim each other but one was more action oriented, meaning like car chases and stuff. And that wouldn't really work well for a play. But the other one was set in like a few rooms and there was enough material and, and, and a, an entire story there that I thought, OK, why don't I convert this into a play, send it, submit it and see what happens. I did. Uh, the festival uh, accepted it and they brought it to this director producer who's also an actor named Ian W. Hill. Now, Ian Hill met up with me. And like right from the very first meeting, I could tell that he he got exactly what I was going for in this piece. And he went on to produce it, act in it, and it was incredible. And it ran four different nights during this festival. And I was, you know, I was I was bitten by the bug. You know, I was like, oh, wait, I'm going to do more of this. So cut to a few years later and, you know, between doing Red Hook, other freelance stuff, writing other things, I'm hanging out with my, my buddy Phil and he's saying how much he, he digs my writing, and, and he says, well, why don't you write something, and maybe uh, I'll produce and direct it, and we'll do something. So I was like, hell yeah. So I, I dug up another old screenplay of mine, and I and he had told me, well, let's just do it as a one act. And I still don't understand the actual rules of a one act, but I think it can be 10 pages, maybe up to 20 tops or 15, something that's small and doable. But, you know, you don't do a run of that on its own. It becomes part of an ensemble or something, you know. 
So I took a part of the screenplay, whittled it down to, uh, you know, 20 essential pages, showed it to Phil and he really dug it. But then I was like, I want to, I want to add this. I want to add this thing back in there. I'm changing this part over here. And slowly but surely it turned into a full fledged play. So we did a couple of readings um, um, with, with Phil uh, producing them at these private little sessions. Uh, concurrently, I had met Stoya, the porn star, and she uh, and I collaborated on an, uh, a comic for Heavy Metal where I took one of her essays and adapted it into comics form, and we got very friendly. And I was thinking about, well, you know, the, the female lead, I thought, I kept thinking about Stoya and how she could probably act this. So I asked her to read it. She did a great reading. Uh, she had great chemistry with the, the initial original readers that we were going to put this on with. But then, you know, uh, what, what ultimately happened is that there, it's really expensive and hard to put on a play in New York City, even an off, off Broadway kind of even a three night run, you know, costs an arm and a leg. And so me and Phil decided, OK, listen, we don't want to finance this. I know I couldn't finance it. He was having a, a tough time. We would have to maybe kickstart it or whatever. And it just didn't seem feasible. So but because we had cast one of the characters uh, for Ian to play, we approached Ian and asked if he would uh, produce and direct this. And and he he said yes. So but because he has a relationship as a technical director at the Brick Theater, we were, he was able to find uh, th this time and space that it's coming out now, and he cast a lot of the characters with his theater company, and we kept a couple of, of the people that uh, we, we were originally going to use, like Stoya and Phil Cruz and some other people, and it's been an incredible experience thus far. Uh, I'm actually going to a rehearsal, I believe, tomorrow night, and then a technical uh, rehearsal, I think, next week. And then it launches October 28th in about 10 days. I saw on the title card, like all the actors are listed, I saw Christopher Lee. Yeah. <laughs> Someone else mentioned that, you know? <laughs> and it's a – which is funny because it's about uh, – okay, the story is basically about a, a, a boxer who died a year ago and doesn't know it. And he's become inadvertently against his will an angel of death, but he has amnesia which seems to be a theme in my, some of my stories here. Um, and, and he realizes that he's always around people who are dying. This was something that actually happened to me. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. And they're always dying. He's trying to like reconcile a couple of things. Like who am I and why every time I'm around people, they're dying. And what's this all about? You know? Uh, and it's hard for him to make friends because everyone is passing away pretty soon. And finally, he meets another one, another person like him. And that person reveals some information about how what they're doing and, and, and what their tasks are. And and he goes away. And then our, our protagonist realizes, wait a second, I come and I touch people and I get them to go on to their next level. Who didn't come and get me? And it almost becomes like a murder mystery, you know, for his, for his own like, you know, uh, you know, consciousness of like, well, who am I and why did this happened to me and what's going on? Meanwhile, there's a parallel story. So there's a, a if one story is about a guy who's become immortal and he doesn't want to be immortal because it sucks. Uh, there's another character who is mortal. He's a he's a chef, but he's a serial killer and he wants to become immortal. And in his own craziness, he decides uh, the way you survive, the way you can become immortal is if you cut out the heart of someone every day and take their heart and place it over your breast pocket and hide your heart, when death comes, uh, you can trick death and they will take the, the wrong heart and you'll survive that day. So he's fucking insane, this guy, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so there's this parallel story happening where you have one character that's trying to negotiate the terms of immortality until finally he wants to die and the, the subtitle is die die again because immortality sucks and he doesn't know how to deal with it although he starts to meet people who are dealing with it in different ways and then there's the other character uh the antagonist who uh is this psycho who is is seeking immortality and and then they come to a crossroad in the in the finale of the play and i won't give away what happens 
And you have a gore consultant on the play as well. Yeah, at some point they were calling it gore noir because I've definitely read a lot of gore into it. And I was worried about, I was like, are we going to have blood? Can we can we have blood? Because that can, provi- you know, create a, a problem with the floor, you know, being bloody. And so, yes, there's a gore consultant because part of the play is kind of like a Grand Guignol. And the Grand Guignol was like French theater in, in the, gosh, I forget what era, where there was a lot of blood packets and it's, it, you know, <laughs> blood everywhere. And, and I love that kind of stuff. And, and so this, this play was inspired by something that actually happened to me many years ago, which when it did happen to me, I did what a lot of people do when you're trying to, you know, confront uh, something that confuses you. And I made art out of it. And what happened is that there was a, a few weeks where every time it seemed like every time I walked out the door of my apartment, somebody died around me. Somebody got hit by a car. Somebody jumped off a building. There was constant death happening around me at all times to the point where I took it a little personally. And I thought, all right, is it me? Did, am I doing this? Am I activating this in some way? So what I decided was I would just lock myself in the house and maybe it would, there'd be less death. And then while being, you know, not going out and I'm a social person, so that was really difficult for me. But by not going out, I started to create a story around this so that I could realize that I was being a fool and it was just mere coincidence. I mean, it was horrible, but it was a coincidence. I had nothing to do with these people's fate just by walking out the door. Uh, and then I started writing this story that eventually evolved into Harry Carey Kane. And that's going to run from the 28th through the 20th of November. Yeah, exactly. The October 28th to November 20th, there's 10 shows at the Brick Theater in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And I, I, I do know that a lot of people are coming to opening night, so that's good. And I suspect that, you know, I, I'm hoping that we'll get some early reviews to also gain some traction. Well, if I can figure out a way, I'm going to get there. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> I said to my wife, I said, you know, you wanted to go to New York. Um, I have an idea. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Work with me here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess you have to deal with hotels and travel and stuff, you know, but uh, definitely, you know, it would be great if you could come to the play, but definitely also arrange other things you'd be doing too, you know, while you're in New York city. You know? Sure. Yeah. And I'm about to be, I'm almost done. I think I need a week, a real concentrated week, like a retreat. I've been talking to my best friend about going on a writer's retreat with him for about a week um, to finish my third play that I'm writing. Man, you're a busy guy. Well, as you're talking to me at almost 10 o'clock at night, and uh, you know, I'm at my art table, not at home. Uh, sit, you know, and I'm looking at literally like 11 other empty art tables because they all know how to balance work with uh, <laughs> pleasure and life, you know, like, and I don't seem to know how to do that. Well, it's because I'm constantly working and we're not even, you know, I'll just hint at something else. I don't, I'm not really shouldn't talk about, but I'm also developing a television show for a major network. All so right. yeah, I, I, and Again, it that could could not happen because the likeliness of that is is like a snowball's chance in hell type thing, you know. But but it, it's looking good. But we'll see what happens. Now, do you want to talk a bit about the freelance work you're doing? So, gosh, what else am I doing? I I don't know if they've announced. I think they did announce it, but you know, Lion Forge Comics, right? Actually, I haven't heard of them. No. All right, so Lion Forge, you might know them through another thing they're doing called Catalyst Prime. It's like this new superhero universe from this publisher. I don't know if your store stocks them or not, um, but Joe Illage is the editor in chief of this particular line of comics for Lion Forge called Catalyst Prime, which is a new superhero universe of so diverse characters. They also have, um, they also publish a lot of other kinds of comics. Hold on, I'm looking at this catalog right now. They have something called Roar and Cub House, and those are more like kid, kid, you know, kid uh, graphic novels and, and young adult stuff. Um, but they, um, so, so Joe hired me to draw covers for this new character they have called Kino, uh, that I believe Joe Casey is writing, and I think the first issue is coming out soon. But they have a lot of talented people who work for Marvel and DC writing and drawing uh, these 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 Catalyst Prime comics. There's they got Alice DeCampi, Amy Chu. Um, I know Kari Randolph has been doing covers. I mean, they have a lot of great talents. Uh, uh, Anthony Ray Height, I think, is drawing one of the comics. So look them up because because they're doing something that a lot of people are afraid to do, which is to spark a new universe of superheroes, which is kind of like what I did last year with the Red Hook uh, and, and the new Brooklyn Universe, 
uh, I co-created another character called The Purple Heart that's written by Vidal Del Sante and drawn by Ricardo Venancio. And then the late Seth Kushner, my good buddy Seth, had uh, created The Brooklynite and, and was uh, co-created and drawn by Seamus Bial. And then Seamus had to take over writing chores when Seth passed away to integrate uh, The Brooklynite into the new Brooklyn universe when we decided to launch uh, you know, The Red Hook with basically three different comics that would embody this first season of new superheroes. So what Lion Forge is doing with Catalyst Prime is something that I, I, I was doing online is to basically try to compete with Marvel and DC, which is nearly impossible, you know, uh, because they're just more superheroes. And I, and I know a lot of publishers actively uh, avoid trying to do that because they know that the market is lousy with superheroes. There's too many superheroes, you know? Well, I'll definitely check that out. That sounds like it's right at my alley. There's a lot of great stuff. Definitely check it out. And hopefully your, your store is carrying it, you know? And I think that the, the first story arcs have basically been completed from the, from the first volley. Like, I think they're four-issue story arcs, so they're probably going to be coming out with uh, collections soon. I will check it out, and I will talk to my comic store as well. And I'm trying to think what else I'm working on. Um, I, you know what it is? It's like when you're working on so much stuff, you almost forget what you're, look, you're working on until I go look at a list. Um, <laughs> I've done some stuff for Heavy Metal Magazine, which is a lot of fun. I, I hope to do more. Um, I, I'm i pitching to publishers. I did, I did a three-part Red Hook story in Dark Horse Presents earlier this year. Uh, that came out and that was fun. Um, gosh, I just, you know what it is? I'm trying to stay on track and try to, trying to, as much as I enjoy getting paid well to draw other company characters, I'm trying to stay in this place of autonomy where I want to continue developing the Red Hook and other characters. Hell, I'd like to revisit Billy Dogma. I have, I have a bunch of Billy Dogma scripts that I want to draw. So with that in mind, one of the things I'm thinking of is if I want to stay on track, is I might spark a Patreon at some point and maybe start doing an exclusive webcomic on my Patreon for uh, for those folks and then you know eventually put that in print. I, I'm still trying to figure out the logistics and, and the plan, but that's something I'm considering soon. Before I let you get back to work, I have a few questions that I ask all my guests, and we were just talking about work-life balance. So what do you like to do for rest and relaxation when you're not working at the drawing board? I like to go to the Russian Turkish bathhouse only because I'm in so much pain, all the chronic uh, pain, because, you know, and I don't have a bathtub. I've been living in the same apartment in Brooklyn for 20 years now with a, a, a shower stall. And, you know, I, whenever I go to the Russian Turkish bathhouse, especially there's this other one called the mermaid spa, the mermaid spa has a huge hot tub in it. So if I could just immerse myself in a hot tub, just so I could, it's like healing to me, you know? So that's one of the things that, like, my default, if I have a day off, one of the first things that, you know, triggers in my mind is, you know, a hot bath or, or a steam or something like that. Um, but, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to say, like, watching TV or reading books because I do that. I manage to, to, you know, eke that out, you know, regardless of my work schedule. You know, I do tend – I mean, even if I'm watching something a couple of years after it came out, like I watch all television on DVD. I don't. I don't have cable, so I, I'm not. I'm not part of the water cooler conversation and 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 you know talking about you know uh, or and I don't binge watch either because I think that's unfair to the actual programming. Uh, even though they do kind of, I think I, I in watching Daredevil and Jessica Jones and finally catching up on some of those Netflix shows I've heard about, I do realize that there's a lot of padding in those shows. Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, so that's why they're kind of made for binge watching, you know, because they'll take like something that is essentially maybe six or eight episode episodes of story and, and pad that and turn it into 13 episodes. And you can feel it. At least I can as a writer, you know, yeah. um, and, and you probably can as a consumer uh, and viewer as well. But um, so I'm not going to say like watching movies, television, reading books, all that, because, you know, I do manage to, to carve out an hour here or there, every, you know, every couple of days. Um, but I, I mean, as much as I wish I could do hiking and stuff, I do like going to the country. I don't meditate, but there's a certain meditation to just going and being a around nature and water, you know? Um, I think in a way what I, what I like doing is just turning myself off. And then, you know, when I'm in the city and I, and I, and I try to get to hang out with my best friend, Mike Houston, or a couple other people, I tend to go to this uh, bar called Sonny's, 
uh, that's at the very end of Red Hook. And it's like every time I walk in there, it's like walking back in time to like the 1950s because that, that bar hasn't changed since the 1950s. And in the back room, I'm not a religious person, uh, but I like to think I'm a little spiritual. And in the back room, they, they play like this freestyle bluegrass on Saturday nights. And I literally get to walk in there. And I'm a guy that's always on and always telling stories, always thinking about other people or how to entertain. But when I get into this back room, uh, I, you know, with, with a, a shot of, of whiskey or something, I just I get to chill out and turn off and just immerse myself into the spirituality of this music. And it, and it feels like a certain kind of kind of heaven when I'm in there. So, I mean, that, you know, it, it it's very base and basic what I what I tend to do. I don't tr I don't I've never had money, really. So I don't have like dreams of going here and going there and doing crazy wild stuff. It literally is like it's like just trying to steal time just to put restore balance into my life. You know, hang out with my girlfriend, actually, you know, cook a meal with her. That that to me is something I strive for. Yeah, the simple things sometimes are the best. I mean, yes. as I get older, I appreciate those simple things and those quiet times <laughs> that don't cost a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. It's not about money at all. You know, I mean, one of my favorite things to do when I could do it and I had the time was to sit on a stoop. You know, sit on a stoop, maybe with a friend, and just watch people. And and you know, you just you can th you can think of, you know about their their lives and create stories or actually just observe and listen to them, you know, and, and hear what they have to say. Now, my other question is a hypothetical. Mm -hmm. You're on a deserted island. What's the one book you would want to have with you? I, I, I am ashamed to admit that I haven't read as many books as I'd like to. And... <sighs> it could be something that you want to get to reading and you just don't have the time right now. Oh, that's interesting. Like the one that I would want to get to read. Um... You know, it's so many different kinds of answers because I would think, you know, there's comic books, you know, definitely I can think of. But I mean, I, I am I'm leaning toward prose. And then sometimes I've been reading a lot of I've been reading William Goldman lately, you know, the, the screenwriter who I think passed away a few years ago. And and I like I like the stuff where he's he's educating you, like telling you about his process. Because what it does is it makes me think about my process and it makes me think about stories that haven't been written yet. So it, what it does is it activates my imagination. So rather than pick a book where I guess I could reread it over and over again uh, and try to even read between the lines and, you know, and, and all that stuff, I, there was some, I'm reading a book right now he wrote called uh, Which Lie Did He Tell? And it's an interesting kind of sequel to uh, Adventures in the Screenwriting Trade. And... And I've been learning a lot. It's making me think a lot about what is story. And maybe that's just where my head is at right now. Um, I'm also really fond of Joe R. Lansdale's Happ and Leonard novels that have now been turned into television. The way he writes and what he writes about, I think, is really brilliant. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a huge fan of the autobiography of Malcolm X. Uh, there's such 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 incredible uh you know, uh, lessons in that book that again, activates my imagination and makes me think about humanity. Um, yeah, I, I don't have like a favorite book. I don't think, I mean, I'll probably get off the podcast with you and then I'll have my answer. Right. <laughs> but, uh, right. but yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to think of what the takeaway would be for me. If I had to pick one book, I mean, it's such an impossible answer. Uh, you know, I mean, then, then there's a part of me that, I've never read Old Man in the Sea, which I, I, I suspect is a very simple story because it looks like it's simple, but probably does the kind of things I've been talking about. Like it's some kind of meditation that makes you think, you know. Um, I also love Richard Price's Clockers. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, that's okay. I mean, a lot of people struggle with it. Uh, some people know right away because they read the same book every year. Uh, uh, so they'll say, oh, yeah. I always read this book, so I would take that book. And some are more practical, um, right. like something, how to get off the island. Uh, you know, I, it's, it's tough to pick out just one. I don't think I've read a book twice. I'm trying to think. I know I've seen movies many times, but I don't think I've ever read one book twice. That's interesting, too. 
All right. I, I got to think about it. <laughs> There's one book I finished last night, and this isn't a pitch because I don't get anything for it, but I just thought I'd let you know about it since I like your right. work, and it's something that you would probably like. It's called uh, Lennon, the New York Years. It's a, a graphic Lennon, novel. Lennon, like John Lennon? Yes. Oh, wow. It's a graphic novel. It's a fictitious story about him and his apartment uh, in New York, and he's going to a therapist and meeting with her each day and recounting his life. Oh, wow. And it's very introspective. And I don't know where the information came from. I don't know how this was sourced. Wait, who published this? IDW published it. Oh, IDW. And okay. I, th I think it's the first time it's been published in English. Oh, so it was published... Uh, I think in France. Was it? it was French. Oh, I see. Okay. I think so, huh. yeah. But there's no references as to where the information came from. Was it his diaries? Was it conversations with Yoko or whomever? But it, right. it does tie in a lot to the history of the Beatles and himself, but it's very introspective about the things he had done the way he grew up you know missing his mother missing his father uh right, regretting right. things he had done it's it's very very interesting and very well done and drawn so you'd probably get a kick out of that book my godmother was one of the first people to call the police when she heard the gunshots oh my god and she uh that's shelly winters yes yeah she lived right next door to where Lennon lived on 72nd street there oh my god so yeah and then uh, she heard the gunshots, called the police, and then a little while later, that you know, everyone found out that he had been shot and killed. So mm. yeah. wow. it's crazy. Yeah. Well, thanks for the heads up on that. That's yeah. Awesome. No, I think you'd like it. Um, and my last question, and I think you kind of answered it for me, was your beverage of choice. And I should know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know it's not beer or oh. wine. <laughs> oh well, I think the um, the the true answer is Coca Cola because, <laughs> which is like terrible for you. Um, but uh, if I had to have a, you know, an alcoholic drink, um, I'm not sophisticated enough for uh, scotch yet. And also scotch has like a kind of smoky kind of flavor that I can't deal with, you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I tend to do bourbon. And these days I've been drinking Bullet, but I also like Maker's Mark and Jameson and Knob Creek on the rock. Separately. On <laughs> sure. Yeah. No, you know, it's good. funny. I barely drink anymore, you know, because I just can't, I don't have what it takes anymore. Honestly, when I do drink, it's like, I'll drink five shots, you know, in a night, but then I don't drink for like a month, you know, you're good. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. So, I mean, I don't feel like I'm an alcoholic or anything at all. You know, like I just think that like when I drink, I tend to like, like drinking and, and, and I basically, like, hand myself over to the drink at that point, you know, because, you know, uh, I, I'm pretty strict. I, I don't do drugs. I don't smoke or anything like that. And I, and I like to, to live on the edge a little bit or feel that edge in my, in, in my persona and in my work. I don't like to feel dull, you know. Um, and so I think that, that, that for me, whiskey is like this nice medium for me. It's in this in-between space. And... You know, I don't fully control myself, but I also don't feel like I've surrendered either. Uh, and and a, a, again, getting older now means that I can pretty much just drink, you know, uh, for an evening. And then that, that'll be that'll set me straight for about a month, you know, <laughs> right. unless it's Comic-Con and everyone's playing with alcohol for four days and you want to die. You know, that <laughs> probably was also contributing to my to my uh, limping and whatnot, you know, so. Well, it does kill the pain for a little while. True, true. <laughs> well, Dean, thanks so much. I really appreciate it talking about War Cry coming up and your play coming up. So Thank you. I'm going to try to make it out there, and uh, it's always a pleasure talking to you. No, always a pleasure talking to you. And you make it so easy. <laughs> I do? Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. But um, no, I, I appreciate it, and, and, um, and I hope you can come out because I'd love to see what you think about the play. But meanwhile, let me know what you think about War Cry when it comes up. Absolutely. And it's important that when people read that to like it on Webtoons. Oh, and yeah. So it, it, yeah, liking it, of course, is always helpful, you know, metrics and numbers. But I think part of the key is to don't be shy to download the Line Webtoon app, which is free. And it gives you access to many other great comics uh, that are all free and on your phone. So like you're sitting, chilling out, waiting for somebody or bored or whatever. And we're all on our phones, aren't we? And you like comics. This is a great spot to get a, a deluge of comics. Yeah, it's great. I have it on my tablet. It tells me what else I might like. Yep. So it's it's yeah, it's cool. It's it's not you don't get spammed or anything. It's it's fine. It's awesome. Well, thank you. 
Thank you for listening to this episode of Creator Talks. The podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Podbean, and YouTube. If you like what you hear, please rate and review on iTunes and Stitcher. Don't miss a single episode each Thursday. Subscribe. It's free. A new interview will be available each week, and sometimes there'll be a second, maybe even a third interview that week. You can send me feedback and comment on social media. I can be reached at Creator Talks Pod. That's at Creator Talks Pod on Facebook and Twitter. I'm also available on Instagram, Creator Talks Pod. There I will post pictures while I'm on location, as well as my Saturday Silver Age or Older and Sunday Bronze Age Spotlight comics from my personal collection. Don't forget to visit my website, creatortalks.com. There I have listed the latest episode on the homepage, plus a playlist of all the episodes to date that you can listen to online or download. In addition, on the site, I'll be posting my recommended reading picks, as well as written interviews with creators. Also on my YouTube channel are video interviews with creators on location at comic conventions and elsewhere. I know you have a lot of entertainment to choose from and a lot of podcasts to choose from as well. And I thank you for making the time to listen to this one, your best source for comic book writers, artists, and creators. There are more interviews in the works, and you never know who it might be. It is my distinct honor and privilege to speak to these creators and bring you those interviews each week. I'd like to thank my executive co-producer, who makes this possible, Mrs. Calloway. That's all for now. For Creator Talks, I'm Christopher Calloway. Until next time.